Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see it from the institutional standpoint yesterday. It's a pleasure to participate today. Um, I will say right off the bat that it's intimidating to be on a panel with uh, Mr. N. Ravi, who writes the news, and Mr. Ashwini Kumar, who knows the news before the news comes out. <laughs> so all that I have is actually uh, reported news, so it may be outdated, and I'll have to leave the rest uh, to my fellow panelists. Uh, as uh, YSR kindly mentioned, uh, I am going to be speaking from an international and a regional perspective. I'm also trying to bring in uh, more of a U.S. perspective. Obviously, that's my expertise. I've been in India for one year and three months, um, so I, I don't think I've quite hit that tipping point where I can turn over uh, into an Indian perspective. But I do hope to bring together the, the uh, different issues uh, from the two national perspectives I think as well that a lot of my panelists will be speaking about the tension between liberty and security in the domestic context, civil and political rights. Uh, obviously, there's a necessary link between what happens domestically and where, uh, where terrorism comes from, where security concerns originate from uh, on a more regional, international level. So I hope to uh, introduce uh, this regional level and then pass it on uh, down the panel line. Uh, I, I was reading, uh, there's a wonderful paper uh, that emanates from Pakistan called The Dawn. It's a leading English-speaking publication. And there's a wonderful columnist, uh, Huma Yusuf. Uh, and I thought it was a, a telling quote for observing how, how interlinked and how complex international relations and security concerns are uh, in the South Asian region. Uh, this was on, uh, in relation to the U.S.-Pakistan strategic dialogue in Washington, D.C. Uh, just last week. Uh, obviously, it's probably no surprise that with Obama coming to India next week, uh, he had talks with the foreign minister of Pakistan last week. There's definitely a sense that you're keeping the relatives mollified as you go from, from one country to the other. Uh, in any case, uh, Yusuf says that despite all the topics that were addressed uh, over excuse me, a wide-ranging panel, what they really discussed, this is the last sentence, whether inadvertently or inevitably, was India. Uh, and in my work uh, with Dr. Chulia in the Center for Global Governance and Policy, I am beginning to see how much of a linchpin India is uh, in terms of regional security issues. And I think that this is increasingly coming into the countenance of uh, U.S. policymakers as well. So I'll be talking about U.S.-Indian relations and how they impact upon uh, regional security concerns, obviously uh, most evident in Afghanistan and Pakistan. There's been a shift, and actually uh, Shahana and Amit actually both uh, alluded to it in the previous panel, that there, there has been a, a very strong relationship with the U.S., uh, uh, between the U.S. and India uh, over the last, I would say, almost 10 years, but there is a shift that's happened with the new Obama administration. Of course, that's inevitable in some ways, uh, as, uh, you know, party politics will deploy themselves into different ways of seeing foreign policy, different ways of viewing the world, and interacting with it. However, I think the shift is notable and has received a considerable disquiet or, or, or sort of engendered a, a significant disquiet in India, whereas Obama was uh, roundly seen as someone who was very positive for international relations in Europe, um, in the Middle East, Latin America, etc. Uh, Obama wasn't necessarily received with the same amount uh, of praise and excitement in India. And that's because, I believe, during the Bush years, there was a fair amount of favoritism towards India, uh, based generally on strategic um, concerns. Uh, as was alluded to already, India was and potentially still is seen as a buffer against uh, the rising in power of China, uh, another pole to which the US can, with which the U.S. can align itself uh, as it works out strategic alliances uh, in the new world. And with this concept of befriending India, not simply a, on a democracy-to-democracy -democracy basis, but because of the strategic concerns that arise, um, we have this notion that Condoleezza Rice, uh, President Bush, wanted to dehyphenate the relationship between India and Pakistan. And that's the, the concept that I'm going to be focusing on today, the sense of dehyphenation, how well has it worked, and to what extent is Obama rehyphenating? the relationship through his new endeavors in foreign policy. I think that the Bush administration uh, made it clear 
uh, what they were doing um, as they engaged with India. And, and obviously, one of the, the most evident examples of the new friendship was the uh, US-Indo nuclear deal, which we're seeing now in the papers uh, coming to some sort of close with the uh, nuclear uh, liability uh, a deal being signed uh, at the UN. It, uh, you know, it was something that was explicit, though, even in the US domestic context. Condoleezza Rice wrote a, a piece in Foreign Policy where she very explicitly said, we see India as something of a buffer against China, China's ascendancy. Uh, and that's the policy under which Bush worked, uh, the notion of balance of power, uh, of aligning your friends uh, and making sure you know um, who's in your backyard. It's still early, I think, and it's ironic to say this, but two years into Obama's uh, administration, it's probably still early to identify uh, what Obama's foreign policy might be. Obviously, Secretary Clinton is heavily involved as well. Uh, to the extent that you could describe it, however, I would coin it as multilateral pragmatism. Um, and I would like to look at what hy hyphenation, what hyphenation, dehyphenation, and rehyphenation happens uh, in this foreign policy mindset. Um, two things come to mind. You think of Obama as a professor. You think of him as a pragmatist. You think of him sitting around a table of advisors, a table of equals, as, as he claimed that he wanted before the election, um, and, and trying to understand a variety of perspectives and reconcile them come to a very logical conclusion on the cost-benefit analysis for a given situation. That's the pragmatic side, I think, of Obama. Um, the multilateral side is similar to dehyphenation in the sense that he is quite willing and wanting to engage with a variety of, of partners, regardless of historical and regional link, linkages and tensions between these partners. But I, I think multilateral pragmatism, while it can be understood in different areas of the world, and I think uh, the relationship between China, India, and the U.S. is a good example of it. I think it does come up against challenges uh, in the South Asian region, regional context. Um, Dr. Chuli and I just put out a paper on uh, Sino-Indian U.S. relations. And one of the points that we made in the paper uh, was that uh, in, this, in, in light of this shift from the Bush administration to the Obama administration, there is less dependency. The, the India can count less on the U.S. relationship. And some of the ways that we saw that uh, was uh, the, the Obama administration's uh, willingness to engage China on issues like North Korea, even uh, sending a senior Chinese diplomat into North Korea to negotiate with the regime there. Uh, the second attempt, and is another facet of multilateral pragmatism, is a desire to have uh, affected parties sitting around the table. So the North, North Korean situation with new nuclear testing, missile testing, was resolved somewhat by bringing Russia, China, uh, other Japan, other regional partners to the table, and, and having no foibles in using China um, to bring them on side and say, look, when it's to our interest, we would love for you to uh, side with us and help us with this particular problem, which doesn't mean we'll give you your way on another set of problems, as could be seen you know, in the current, current cur currency wars or um, even in terms of the Google spat you know, with China. The rhetoric that the US uses to engage with China is not being watered down necessarily, but I think that pragmatism comes up in engaging with China and saying, where can we join forces where our mutual interests are best served? To an extent, by engaging China uh, beyond what the Bush administration did, India has, I think, felt uh, a little bit of the shaft. Um, I think in some ways, and as I go on in this presentation, it could be a good thing. India may no longer be seen simply as a strategic asset in the Obama administration, and as we'll see over the next couple of weeks, it may be that heightened civil engagement may be the key to ongoing partnership, where India won't be bounced around quite as much by strategic relationships that U.S. might have with other countries. We're moving beyond the initial relationship uh, between the U.S. and India and a certain amount of trust that can be engendered in the partnership can then be deployed uh, towards having other uh, multilateral talks with China, with Pakistan. As I alluded to earlier, I think the major challenge for this new Obama uh, foreign policy perspective may be uh, the South Asian region. It's obviously been a tough situation for the last decade. And as Bob Woodward uh, correctly describes in his new book, 
Obama, you know, very much was scared of the Afghanistan situation, but unsure how to uh, withdraw the U.S. from that situation. It's a catch-22 in so many ways. Given his propensity to want to engage uh, affected partners in dialogue, one of the, the things that he has pushed, and Secretary Clinton has pushed uh, in the past <coughs> year particularly, has been getting partners to the table who wouldn't normally sit at a table together. Um, but the challenges of this region, the challenges of multilateralism in South Asia um, are quite evident. And I, I just point out to you this list of uh, uh, potential partnerships in resolving, uh, stabilizing the Afghanistan region. Uh, look, look at this list and see uh, you know, what, what strikes you first. Which of these uh, parties are really willing to sit down and talk to one another? I went through it. This is not uh, you know, a foreign policy analysis, but <laughs> if you think about it, Iran and the U.S. really are not going to engage on anything above the table uh, with regards to Afghanistan, even as important as, important as Iran is uh, along Afghanistan's southern border. Similarly, Pakistan and India, and that will be the topic, second part uh, of this talk today, U.S. and Russia even have a lot of tensions these days. Uh, you can't say that they are willing foreign policy partners, and India and China certainly have a history of tensions um, that belie the possibility of working together. So when you encounter this situation, what does multilateralism have to offer? Well, hopefully pragmatism. Um, but let's consider then U.S. pragmatism in Pakistan. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to figure out as a news reader, and again, I don't have the inside story on the news necessarily, whether the U.S. Is, has a coherent strategy or whether they're just a bit confused, trying to bounce around, trying to uh, do damage control uh, with relation to Pakistan and Pakistan's relation to Afghanistan and India, respectively. Obviously, in the last few weeks alone, uh, we've had the announcement of a uh, $2 billion military uh, aid package uh, to uh, Pakistani army units fighting um, in the northwest uh, portion of the country. That was tied to a $7.5 billion civilian uh, aid package, which actually had its own tendrils in the U.S. Congress um, and concerns about the use of the money, the conditions being ascribed to that package of aid. But nonetheless, that's an incredible amount of money. And this is really the Clinton Obama's uh, first uh, application or, or, or instance where they are indicating what they're willing to do in engaging with the civil military complex uh, in Pakistan. Clearly, it seems like they're staying the course. They see no other alternative but to feed more money. Uh, into the Pakistani situation, given how important, obviously, Pakistan is to Afghani security. Mollifying the relatives uh, simply means that it seems to be a situation where if Obama comes to Delhi, he promises to go to Islamabad. If Obama is coming to uh, Delhi this week, he actually called President Zahra Dari last week. Uh, so it seems to be that he's trying to take painstaking efforts to uh, make one side understand that he's not trying to al align with the other side against their interests. Whether or not that induces a stalemate rather than any sort of pragmatic pro progress uh, is something else. Again, there's a lot of things that, that come out in the news that you don't know. Um, recently, and a potentially a pragmatic solution to the Afghanistan conflict, um, we, we have uh, Karzai and uh, American leaders, uh, but predominantly through Karzai, sitting down with leaders of Taliban factions uh, for potential peace talks. Uh, this is incredible. You know, it comes out in the New York Times and other media outlets in the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's a little bit ironic as well. You know, if on Monday you're being chased through the woods by a U.S. Predator drone, on Tuesday you're being picked up in a Humvee and being taken to outside of Kabul. Uh, for talks on uh, resolving this situation. So it is a little bit ironic as well. Um, things like the uh, Af AFPAC Transit Trade Agreement, again, a, a trade agreement in which Pakistan insisted that India uh, be frozen out, are again indicative of uh, a massive distrust and an obsession, as this next slide indicates, with the hyphen. So if we're looking at uh, multilateral pragmatism in the South Asian regional context, it's a little bit difficult to figure out whether dehyphenation, i.e. multilateralism, i.e. engaging with both India and Pakistan, advances the agenda any further. Because the pragmatic element of multilateralism under Obama's administration seems to be relinking, rehyphenating what was dehyphenated, 
in terms of engaging both parties and understanding the intricacies and the interconnectedness of the issues 